So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Rosemary Nixon uh, from the Skin and Cancer Foundation. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, Ro is um, certainly Victoria's foremost uh, dermatologist in terms of contact. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. In terms of uh, contact dermatitis, as well as many other fields of um, dermatology, uh, you, any time you go to see Ro, pretty much all her practices practice as doctors in Melbourne who just only go to see Ro Nixon. So um, if you've got some problem with your skin, try and get in, but the wait list is about two years. Um, <laughs> however, uh, we've had a very close relationship with Ro over many years, and in fact, at the Austin, we send all our patients who have any skin problems, we only send them to Rosemary. And uh, with that, we've published a couple of papers on the issues with hand hygiene, uh, various hand hygiene products, and today she's going to talk to us about contact dermatitis to hand hygiene uh, agents. Is it a problem? Thank you. Honoured to be here, and uh, thanks to all of you for giving up your um, Sunday mornings. Fantastic. You didn't go on the run. <laughs> and uh, also lovely to um, see some of the referring doctors uh, and uh, nurses have supported us over the years. So I just want to tell you a little bit about our clinic, our Occupational Dermatology Clinic. So people come along to us with a rash, and it's our job to work out what the rash is and uh, take it from there. So it's a pretty sort of non-specific rash, that's just hand dermatitis for us. We have to make a diagnosis, and uh, in a conventional way, history, examination, or exposure assessment, talk about that. patch testing, uh, the tests we do uh, to make this diagnosis. We'll try and go a bit faster because it'll be on the website. We have to take a really good history. So this is a very much a, a medical uh, area where we really want to know all about the details. How long they had it? Who have they seen? What treatments did they have? Did they get treatments from the next door neighbour, the chemist? Uh, how does it relate to work? Uh, do they have immediate symptoms? Does something burn the skin, sting the skin? Do they have wheezing? Do they have cough? Is it more than just a skin problem? Have they had skin problems before? Have they had eczema, asthma, hay fever? What allergies do they think they have? Are they allergic to cheap jewellery, nickel, most common allergen for us? Uh, problems with gloves, uh, uh, sticking plasters, tapes, drugs, animals, foods, all sorts of things we need to know about them. What's their history? What medication? What do they actually do at work? Um, sometimes what they do at work is not necessarily what is told by their job title. Um, hobbies, household activities, and you'll hear us talk about baby wipes. We've had this epidemic to a preservative in baby wipes. They're big for us at the moment. What does the patient think the rash is due to? So we then have to get an idea of what's happening, what's touching their skin. Um, we can get that obviously from the history. Um, people come to our clinic with all sorts of samples of products. Uh, we can look at the labels. Often they'll come in with uh, lever arch folders of material safety data sheets. We have to plough through them. We look at websites. Uh, my colleagues overseas in, in Malmo, they don't bother looking at the data sheets because they have a laboratory. They can just analyse stuff in their mass spectrophotometer. In Toronto, they have an occupational hygienist that concentrates exclusively on this history taking. Workplace visits we get to do occasionally, um, but they're expensive in our system. Um, but what's revolutionised is people taking photos of their workplace. So this is not perhaps so important for healthcare, but when they're in a factory, when, they, when you say, what do you do? And they say, well, I make this widget out of this gadget. And well, what, are you, what are you actually making? Um, this is a photo from some years ago, seriously, Laverton, a, a tannery. And that sort of green stuff on the ground was chromate solution. It's an allergen and an irritant. So the next thing for us is looking at the skin, um, trying to get a diagnosis from the morphology. Basically, eczema dermatitis, as you'll hear me say, is it's impossible to distinguish. But there are some other non examinous rashes that we can, such as psoriasis, such as tinea, granuloma annulari, porphyria cutanea tarda, scabies. So it's a little bit of a game. We have to look at the rest of the skin, very important, to examine the feet. Sometimes we can get clues of what's happening on the feet with some of these rashes. So we come up with a sort of a, a list of common rashes on the hand. So that gives us a bit of a help um, to try and make a diagnosis. And these are some of those, those rashes. Um, we've uh, developed an algorithm uh, which 
is very helpful over the years. And basically people come in with a rash and we need to make a diagnosis. Um, so the sort of basic thing is, is this rash coming from inside your body? There's actually uh, 4,000 dermatology rashes, 4,000 skin rashes. So the common ones for us are eczema and psoriasis, um, but there are many others as well. We then go to this side and we want to know um, if the rash is, if you like, coming from inside or if it's coming from outside, it's coming from something touching the skin. So we call that contact dermatitis. And this contact dermatitis can be two types. It can be irritant contact dermatitis, and this again is largely of a hand problem. So we have things like water, wet work, wet, dry, wet, dry is very irritating to the skin. Soaps, uh, then physical factors like heat, hot water, sweating from occlusive gloves, friction. And then we have um, allergies. And a little bit complicated, we have two different types of allergies. Delayed hypersensitivity, which is what I do, and immediate hypersensitivity, which is more um, what the allergists do, looking for causes of asthma, hay fever, food allergies, but there's a bit of a crossover as well. We then do testing, we find out what people are allergic to, and then we make a diagnosis. So more about that. We're not actually very good at clinically differentiating the causes of contact dermatitis. So someone comes in, these rashes are actually pretty non-specific, and so we actually often have to test people. And in order to prove how bad we were at making a diagnosis, I unfortunately had to subject myself to uh, critical examination. And I found that in only, in only less than 70% of the cases could I sort of look at someone and say, look, this is definitely irritant contact dermatitis or definitely allergic contact dermatitis or def definitely eczema. It's very hard to make a, a, a diagnosis. So when my colleagues don't send me people to patch test because they know what the diagnosis is, I'm always very sceptical. So we've got history, exposure assessment, clinical examination, and the next uh, way of making a diagnosis is patch testing. So this is what we do in our clinic. So patch testing is a test for delayed hypersensitivity. We put on these tests on the back for 48 hours. Now we don't have to scratch the skin. We're interested in a, uh, an immunological reaction which starts in the epidermis. These tests stay on for 48 hours. Then the tests come off and uh, we rate uh, the spots according to uh, guidelines. And then they come back uh, two days later. The next thing is, once we've got a positive test, what does it mean? Um, we have to then interpret the test and interpret what it means. So we, we classify reactions as either being relevant to the patient's rash or of past relevant. A classic example would be someone that got allergic to uh, nickel and their cheap jewellery and their, their um, uh, ear piece, piercing. Or sometimes we just don't exactly know what the relevance is and where the patient's been exposed. So to actually make a diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis, we need this clinical history of dermatitis, we need a positive patch test reaction, and we need a history of exposure. Um, that, that reaction is relevant to the dermatitis. If there's none of that, we just call it contact allergy, which means they've been sensitised, but we don't know the relevance of it. If, the, on the other hand, the patch tests are negative, therefore we've exclu excluded allergy, the default diagnosis is often irritant contact dermatitis or perhaps a form of endogenous eczema. And one of the things that we've, our group's been very strong on over the years is, is making the point that actually multiple conditions often coexist. People often have multiple contributing factors to their skin condition. So again, we go back to this um, algorithm which we use for uh, uh, educational purposes in the clinic. The next type of reaction we need to consider is these immediate reactions or type 1 reactions. And while these are important for the asthma, hay fever, as I mentioned, there are a number of substances that call, cause what we call contact urticaria, that is on skin contact, they cause immediate redness and burning. And the classic, of course, is natural rubber latex. Many of you are old enough to have lived through the latex epidemic in the 90s. Ammonium persulfate is another one, hairdressing bleach. And then there are other inhalant allergens as well. Um, Chlorhexidine does cause a type 1 reaction, although rarely. So these present with an immediate reaction which often resolves uh, fairly quickly, but repeated episodes can cause a dermatitis, again, that is indistinguishable from allergic contact dermatitis from irritant contact dermatitis. So we have quite a problem with the <coughs> clinical diagnosis of these conditions. Um, we can do prick tests or RAS tests for this sort of allergy. That's an example of a prick test reaction. So when we come to treatment, um, 
a lot of the treatment is actually about making a diagnosis so we can work out how to avoid allergens. And of course, we love this area because we can actually treat people. I did a talk recently, how to cure your patients without surgery or drugs. We can make a diagnosis. We can get people to avoid what they're allergic to and make them better. So it's a great area of medicine to practice. None of those drugs like you have in infectious diseases. <laughs> Uh, the treatment is very much skin protection, skin care, and man is going to talk all about this. And then the uh, prescription treatments, topical steroid ointments, calcium urine inhibitors, physical treatments we use a lot of, ultraviolet light. We have a special form of very superficial radiation at the Skin and Cancer Foundation, it's fantastic, called GRENS. And then we have systemic ther therapies, which unfortunately we sometimes need to use. Just to give you an example of the sort of person we see, a 51 year old uh, male nurse a night shift supervisor with a 20-month history of dermatitis, predominantly on his dominant hand. He thought it was latex, of course, this was a few years ago. Got better off work, good work-related history. He was atopic and a uh, long referring letter from the dermato dermatologist just showing that the semantics are often an issue in this area. I thought it was an irritant contact dermatitis. I thought that he'd been doing this job for a long time, a bit of a cumulative element. We sometimes see that people just work in some occupations and they just got, their hands just give up after a long time of exposures. But on patch testing he reacted to heaps of stuff. Coconut diethanolamide is an emulsifying agent. We'll learn more about that. Formaldehyde, lots of his microshield products, fragrance, chlorosetamides, preserved in a particular type of um, popular red one sorbeline lotion. Composite, it's a plant extract. He wasn't allergic to latex. So putting that all together, he had multiple things going on. He, uh, I felt that the primary cause of his problems was allergic contact dermatitis to the coconut diethanolamide in his microshield products. But he also had uh, allergic contact dermatitis into formaldehyde, which at that stage was in the microshield angel hand gel. He had irritant contact dermatitis from the wet work, that's sort of a given. Um, possibly allergic to fragrance, possibly allergic to chlorosetamide. What was interesting with all of those allergies, his rash wasn't that severe, but then the penny dropped that he was a, he was a night shift supervisor. He probably actually didn't do that much clinical work, but enough. <laughs> he was like the boss. So it's complicated, but unless, unless we list all these conditions, all these contributing factors, these diagnoses, then we can't actually get him better because we have to actually work out all the factors that are contributing to this condition. And, uh, and oftentimes there's stuff at home too. I mean, if someone have, has four kids under five at home, then they've got lots of stuff going on with their skin. So basically, when making a diagnosis, we're using patch testing as a technique in diagnosis, uh, and sometimes we need to do prick testing as well. So if we look at the impact of occupational skin disease, and this is, hasn't quite come up, but basically prevention is a is our priority because we have all these different areas um, being affected, quality of life, um, costs, indirect costs, and of course the public health aspect. And healthcare workers are the largest group uh, in this regard. We have to look at prevention. So healthcare workers are a high risk group for occupational skin disease because of all these exposures, um, hand hygiene requirements, um, use of gloves, cleaning agents, and then the specific tools of the trade, such as acrylates in dentists. And there are many studies worldwide which show that there's quite an appreciable incidence of contact dermatitis, of occupational dermatitis in healthcare workers. So we've reviewed our clinic data uh, over 22 years, uh, just recently. We had 685 healthcare workers assessed in our clinic, uh, and 555 were diagnosed with a work-related skin disorder, predominantly nurses, uh, but also a smattering of doctors, scientists, and dentists. Um, basically, they present with hand dermatitis, but interestingly, uh, sometimes this can be generalised, um, particularly um, sometimes if you have a, a good going allergic chronic dermatitis, it sort of spreads all over the skin. Uh, there may be airborne factors involving the face. Um, briefly, uh, and people could have more than one diagnosis, 79% were diagnosed with irritant contact dermatitis, 50% allergic contact dermatitis, 37% had eczema. So often people who have a background of eczema go into an area such as healthcare and find that their skin is very much irritated by all that hand washing. Latex allergy, uh, contact urticaria, other things other than latex, often called hexidine. 
two thirds of people had, had multiple contributing factors to their skin condition. And 27% had lost time from work. Um, with the irritants, uh, wet work is a big factor. Um, hand cleaners, environmental factors. But the diagnosis of irritant chronic dermatitis is very much a su subjective one. We can't test that. We, we can really make that diagnosis by excluding allergy. So it's a subjective diagnosis. On the other hand, we can say a lot about allergy because we can diagnose this very, very uh, uh, accurately. So the, the important group at the top uh, are rubber chemicals. So rubber um, uh, consists of uh, accelerators which give rubber its, its property, its properties of sort of being elastic. So we have latex, which is a rubber protein, and then we have rubber chemicals will be in both latex gloves and in non-latex in nitrile gloves, and they'll give the, the rubber its, its properties. And over the years, we've thyram uh, and thyram-related chemicals have been our number one allergen in all works of life. But there are other things, uh, preservatives, we'll go through some of the ones which are relevant for healthcare workers in more detail. Um, we have seen this uh, huge uh, spike of allergies to this chemical <coughs> methyl isothiazolone. I'll say a bit more about that. Fortunately, we're seeing less allergy to rubber accelerators over the, over the 20 years. Um, there have been various improvements in manufacturing, so there are less uh, residual amounts of this stuff in the gloves, but thyrams and carbamax have been big allergens over the past. Uh, what you might need to know about if you don't is that there is a, an accelerator-free glove called Ansel Micro Touch Nitro Free. It's pink and it doesn't have those thyrams and carbamates in it and it's a nitrile glove, so no latex. Um, over this time we've seen uh, a big diminution in latex allergy. It's, it's not gone though. It's, it's sort of, I say, it's, it's forgotten but not gone. Uh, we still see people particularly um, people that buy latex gloves from the supermarket, so not so much in the healthcare sector, more in the sort of aged care and, uh, and other areas. Preservatives are the big one, so there are a lot of different preservatives. We need preservatives, anything that's water-based is going to need a preservative, otherwise it will go, go bad. So we have formaldehyde and formaldehyde releases, but it's this particular one that's been this methyl isothiazolone, which we've just, you know, we've had something like 20% of people attending our clinic being allergic to this is the biggest epidemic that I've seen in uh, contact dermatitis in my lifetime. And there are a number of products in the hospitals, as you can see, that, that have methyl isothiazolone. And as I said, it's been huge in baby, baby wipes. Um, that's, it's now pretty much been taken out of, uh, with a lot of lobbying from us. Um, but there are still a lot of products out there. And it's, it got to the stage that anyone that comes with a history of contact dermatitis, we say, look, avoid methyl isothiazolone and, and then come for testing because it's so likely that they'll have problems. There are other excipients in hand cleaners which have caused problems, such as coconut diethanolamide, which I mentioned, and lanolin, and then, of course, the antiseptics. And we've termed these the hard-to-avoid allergens. And, uh, and this is a quite a problem because someone, a healthcare worker is doing their job, they're washing whatever's been provided by the hospital and they're getting allergic to stuff. So that tells you it's the responsibility of the manufacturers to, to take out stuff which can cause allergy, particularly when you're dealing with people who have a, a damaged <coughs> skin barrier because they've had to wash their hands a lot. Um, so when we reviewed our causes of allergic chronic dermatitis, we've actually found a variety of predominantly micro shield hand cleaners uh, being the top uh, causes of allergic chronic dermatitis. And, and there's been this sort of um, thing about social hand washing that, you know, you can use these things and they're fine. And I mean, they don't have any antiseptics, microshield skin cleanser, but it has a lot of other things that can cause allergies. When we look at, compare the rate of allergies to those products compared to alcohol-based rubs, we find that we have an eight times rate of allergic contact dermatitis <laughs> to those hand cleansers than the alcohol-based hand rubs, which are often very, fairly simply, fairly simple uh, uh, preparations, and uh, with alcohol uh, very, very, very rarely being an allergen. So we can say quite categor categorically that alcohol-based hand rubs are much better in terms of allergy for the skin, that hand cleansers uh, you know, do contribute to irritant contact dermatitis. But the problem is that alcohol-based hand, hand rubs do do cause stinging, and so people tend to perceive that as being allergy. Mandy will talk more about this 
and then they stop using them and then they go back to the hand cleansers which have actually got more allergens in them. Uh, and as Lindsay said, we collaborated years ago looking at <coughs> the fact that um, there were less rates of reactions to uh, hand hygiene solutions than uh, the traditional stuff. So my conclusions, we see these hand rubs causing sub substantially less allergic conic dermatitis than the commercial hand cleaners. Um, seeing does not equal allergy, so we have to, we have to um, explain that to our, our healthcare workers. We had a lot of reactions to so-called hard to avoid weak allergens present in the commercial hand cleaners, and obviously it's important that the manufacturers understand that they've got to get rid of this stuff. Uh, rubber glove chemicals have been an issue, but they're less of an issue now, and we've got to look out for this chemical methyl isothiazolinone. Overall, we have a significant burden of disease, often mild disease, but nevertheless uh, disease in healthcare workers. So what can we do about it? So at an individual level, there's education and, and early management. Again, Mandy's going to talk more about that. Secondary prevention, once it's started, we've got to look at allergen avoidance and substitution and use of the accelerator-free gloves. At a manufacturer level, a lot of the pro uh, some products aren't labelled properly, um, and we've got to look at allergen substitution. And then beyond, obviously, promotion of alcohol-based hand rubs is important. And where we come in, into is integrating the skin care education uh, with the hand hygiene and uh, we'll talk more about that. That's I think a very important way to go. So Safe Work Australia has supported us to develop um, hand, uh, some skin care uh, advice into the hand hygiene model. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce Mandy now who's going to talk more about this. Mandy is a nurse who's done health promotion, uh, worked with me for years and years. I think I'm her only <laughs> boss. Still comes to work with me from Bendigo, uh, manages our database, manages our clinic, and uh, has been terrific in this area, and particularly in some of the innovations that we've done. So I'll finish with that. Sort of introduce Mandy for you, but you can. <laughs> Thanks very much.